Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, we're doing Community Matters this morning with C Congressman Ed Case. We are delighted to have him on the show. Welcome, Ed. Nice to see you. Aloha. Good to be back. So, um, as I was saying before, you know, we, li we live through your eyes. Um, we, we see through your eyes what is going on. And, and, and to a certain extent, we see through the filter of your emotional reactions what's going on. And I wanted to get a handle on how you see and feel um, these events over recent weeks and, and the events to follow, um, you know, what, what has been your experience watching this election process be, you know, be, be attacked this way and undermined, uh, along with the other things that have undermined our democracy over the past few years? Well, first, I think I want to take a little issue with your premise, uh, <clears throat> because um, from my perspective, what I'm trying to do is, is to take, uh, you know, 750,000 people that I represent here, uh, who have a variety of different views about what's actually going on and try somehow to synthesize that and translate that into what I should be doing to truly represent uh, them and you back in Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, I don't think I don't think it's, you know, starts and ends with my eyes. It's really a longer process than that. But I, of course, am the U.S. congressman for the first congressional and one of two uh, for Hawaii. And I, I live and work in Washington, D.C. And so, yes, my job <clears throat> is very much to to tell people back home what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling uh, and, and to allow them to uh, participate uh, through me in, in what's actually going on in Washington, uh, for better or worse. So to answer your question, um, it is, a, um, of course, a uh, very, very uncertain, very chaotic time uh, for our country. Uh, we've had a chaotic four years, uh, but uh, when you, when you uh, take all of the factors of um, any uh, presidential transition, especially a transition where where an incumbent has been beat, which hasn't happened that often in our history, um, that, is all, that is always a very uncertain and to some extent chaotic time. Uh, number one, number two, what is added to that, of course, is um, this president's um, approach to the transition. I think that has certainly complicated things. I think we could all uh, say that, uh, whether we voted for or against uh, President Trump. Uh, number three, Congress is also turning over um, so we are ending a two-year Congress, and we're going into the next Congress, uh, and some of the elections that are going to be key to how Congress responds are themselves uncertain uh, to elections in Georgia, most uh, directly. And then finally, of course, we're sitting in the middle of, uh, of, a, of a pandemic and a public health and an economic crisis uh, that um, is not going away. Uh, and so, you know, perhaps in March and April, we thought, okay, fine, we can lick this by the fall, and then we'll have an election, and then we'll all Kind of be off to the races whatever happened after the election well that did not happen um and it is not happening so you take all of those factors together and for me um it is it is trying to to navigate with as much uh with as much uh, uh um you know stability um and uh, calmness and and sense of purpose as i possibly can uh, on behalf of hawaii to continue uh, to rather to complete uh, this congress which ends on january 3rd and to and to work into the next Congress. Um, and of course, COVID-19, you know, doesn't care whether Congress turns over or presidents turn over. So that's not going anywhere. Uh, but there are many things that are on my plate. Uh, but what I try to do uh, very hard is to, is to uh, uh, you know, keep my, my focus on my job, which is uh, contribute to national leadership, uh, number one. Number two, to help Hawaii wherever and however I can. And number three, to help individual people with their with their own needs. And, and I would add to that list um, in this particular time uh, that I am, um, I am changing partners. Uh, Congresswoman Gabbard's term ends and, and Congressman-elect Kaheli's uh, term begins. And so I'm very much involved in that transition uh, because for a small state like Hawaii, uh, you only have four, two in the house and we gotta be tight all the time. So that's very, very much on my mind. Yeah, I had the impression from comments you made with him, Kai Kaheli, um, that there was a partnership here, uh, that you guys want to work together, and, and, and that's obviously a, a great way to go. Do you agree? Yes, and, and I, I would also say, though, that I had a good partnership with uh, Tulsi as well. Um, you know, I, I have a good, solid personal relationship uh, with her. We agree on many, many issues. Uh, we certainly agree on trying to help Hawaii wherever we can. Um, and um, in Hawaii, although we technically have, you know, two districts, uh, First congressional being urban Honolulu that I represent, and the second congressional being 
the rest of Oahu and, and the state uh, that I used to represent, that Tulsi now represents. So those are our technical districts. But I think everybody in uh, Hawaii that you know, follows this in any way, shape or form, and even if you don't follow it, you really don't think about your U.S. representatives as, as you know, district uh, focus. We are really wow. two at large uh, members of, of Congress, if you want to think about it that way. And so I, I've had a good solid two years with, uh, with Tulsi. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a real privilege for me to serve with her, and, and we've gotten a lot done together. But, I mean, the first month that I returned to Congress, she, of course, announced her, her presidential uh, campaign, and that's where her attention was. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I, and I don't fault her for that. That was her right. That was her privilege. That was her choice. Uh, but um, it's tough to carry the entire state. You really need two full-time uh, contributors. So I am looking forward uh, to, to um, you know, uh, Congressman-elect uh, Kaheli coming in and really being full-time focused on, on his, his duties in the House. We also have a very long, uh, you know, personal and professional relationship, dates back almost 20 years now. Uh, we both come uh, from the Big Island. Uh, we're both, uh, you know, from Hilo. Uh, we have a lot of shared um, experiences, uh, shared emotions, I would say, shared approaches to how we you know how we how we deal with certain issues. So I think it's been it's going to be a, a smooth transition to the credit of both uh, Tulsi and Kai, and um, it's going to be a, a good solid partnership. I think it's going to be a good delegation overall. I mean we're all you know we're all different people, uh, but um, I think it's a, a good solid uh, uh, four way partnership. Now, now, <clears throat> so there was some issue about whether Nancy would uh, Nancy Pelosi would would continue uh, whether the House would reorganize itself with some other leader. Um, how do you feel about the ultimate choice, which seems to be that Nancy will continue? Um, uh, you, you've lost some seats, Republicans. Uh, I'd also like to know how you feel about whether that will change anything as far as the House, uh, the House actions are concerned. Well, there was really never any uh, doubt that uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi was going to continue as a speaker. Um, I, you know, she, she was unopposed uh, to return as speaker, and, and she she was uh, voted in by, by um, acclamation. Um, so there was not even a recorded vote. Actually, that's a caucus decision. Uh, we do have to all vote individually on the first day of Congress. Uh, uh, but I, I expect that there's not going to be anything, you know, that's going to change between now and January 3rd. Um, but that is not to say um, that there isn't a lot of um, a lot of discussion, a lot of angst, a lot of questions um, as to why, um, on balance, uh, the House Democrats uh, lost seats as opposed to pick them up. We were expecting to pick them up, but um, obviously, uh, in those frontline swing districts across the country, um, the bottom line is those districts uh, did did in fact. Uh, uh, get lost many and many of my very good friends uh, were among those so it's a that's a that's an emotional time i mean you you, you form friendships and then you know one day uh, your your partners with them in congress and the next day their voters have decided to, to return them home or you know turf them out uh, and um you still have that friendship but um you know there's there's a couple of people in particular that i just uh, was really far down the road with that i'm going to really really miss um I think that, um, and I think that that decision, that that question has to be asked. Why? Why did that happen? And for that matter, um, I think there's a larger question uh, because we're obviously in a divided country here. And although uh, President, uh, President-elect uh, Biden got the highest popular vote total in the history of our country, President Trump got the second highest vote total in the history of our country. Uh, here in Hawaii, um, uh, President Trump got 35% of the vote. So one in three voters have voted for uh, President Trump, and I think, I think I have to, as 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 the person that represents them, um, even though I did vote for President-elect Biden, um, I still have to represent those folks. And so um, I think we all need to understand a little bit more um, what actually is going on. Um, there's going to be some areas where you're just never going to have any agreement at all, um, but there's a whole middle of this country um, that is quite uncertain, and the state for that matter, um, is quite uncertain about uh, the direction of, of, of really either party um, and, and, and has, um, has decisions to make every election. And my job is to try to understand what that is, why, and how do I embrace uh, the folks that uh, did vote for me and the folks that didn't. Yeah, interesting. Uh, are you a cross the aisle kind of guy, uh, you know, who makes uh, friends with Republicans and, and tries to collaborate with them on issues and, and actions? 
I do. I look for those opportunities. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's there are issues um, that um, uh, you know there's 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 really um, it's very hard to strike some middle ground. Um, there are extreme not I won't say extremes, just two two ways of approaching an issue. And um, you know, one way is one way, and the other way is the other way. And at some point, uh, people are kind of locked into what they think is the right direction, and you have to just vote. And that's a straight majority vote, um, and that's how the system should operate. However, if the only thing you do is just line up majority votes all the time without trying to find those areas of agreement and collaboration and consensus where you actually can uh, get something done that's that's you know more than just 51 percent, where you're up into the 70s, 80s, 90 90 percent. That's worth the effort, and so yes, I, I absolutely do uh, look for those opportunities. I'll give you I'll give you one quick example. Um, uh, this uh, this this current term, uh, I and um, uh, fellow Democrats and Republicans uh, form the Pacific Islands Caucus. First time that Congress has ever had a caucus, which is a collection of members of Congress that come together for a, for a specific purpose, focused on the Pacific and the Pacific Island countries and jurisdictions. Uh, that was completely bipartisan. Uh, we introduced out of that caucus uh, um, a major bill uh, called the Boosting Long-Term U.S. Engagement in the Pacific or the Blue Pacific uh, Act. And um, that, would, that had two primary introducers on the D side and two primary introducers on the R side. So that was an area that I found common ground and we pursued it. But there's other times that you just, you just, you know, the same people that I'm working with on the Pacific Islands Caucus, we don't agree on every vote. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, to me, it, it seems, just, I'm just making a guess, but if you have more Republicans, still, the Democrats have the majority, but if you have more Republicans, um, they're less likely to be amenable to discussions because they feel they have more leverage that way. Uh, and it may be hard for you to, you know, actually convince them to come over to, you know, the more liberal side, if you will. And I, and I wonder, um, if, there, if do you have conversations with some of them? where you say, look, you know, can't you change your mind about this? You know, gun control is a good thing, whatever the issue may be. Um, let me try to persuade you. Is that possible? It is possible, um, and it does happen, and I do have those conversations. Um, I don't take somebody's position uh, for granted uh, just because they've said that's their position. You know, that's that's part of the, the legislative process is, is understanding you know, why somebody feels that way and whether there's a way to solve their problem. Um, and similarly with me. And so that that is as it uh, as it should be. Um, there are some issues that um, um, are are very, very tough, uh, either uh, uh, philosophically or increasingly in a very divided and polarized country. Let's say that <clears throat> let's say that a Republican actually does agree that we should, again, ban assault weapons. Uh, that's a position that um, I believe we should. Uh, and um, somewhere around 80, 85 percent of the American people, including many Republicans, believe we should ban assault weapons. Uh, but to get Republicans to vote on that, or, or, or they may believe that, uh, but they're so petrified of a very, very vocal uh, part of their primary uh, election electorate um, that it's very hard for them to do that Politically, I would say on your on your uh, basic observation um, that it's harder. It's actually easier uh, in a in a uh, situation where uh, we have a, a, a very slim majority, the, the, the slimmest majority we've had in 20 years. Um, that actually is easier to get things done uh, in the middle uh, because um, you cannot you cannot round up automatically a majority of Democrats to ram <laughs> to ram through a a a, a um, you know a bill or a proposal um, that um, forty to fifty of those Democrats don't agree with. You used to be you know if you've got a twenty person majority then yeah twenty Dems can can uh, you know vote no on it you'll still pass it but now your mar your margin is eight Dems yeah. uh, many of whom are in frontline districts uh, so um, and there and I think the the minority party, the Republicans in this case, uh, would look for those opportunities, unfortunately, unfortunately, both to fashion a, a mid, middle ground consensus bill that could pass and to exploit uh, those divisions. Right. So um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And then, of course, in two years time, we'll have another election and, those, you know, the, the House will be in play again. Um, but let me ask you about the Senate. The Senate is so interesting. And McConnell, I, I really thought McConnell 
um, you know, was the second quality candidate as, as against that woman. I think her name is Amy Thatcher, um, uh, who was running against she re retired Marine pilot as well. And very, very presentable, very articulate, very smart, but she lost. And so McConnell is there again. The Senate is, um, you know, depending on what happens in Georgia, the Senate is in control. The House had been frustrated on so many things, and it's been impossible for Congress to act on so, so many things because the Senate has been intransigent. I mean, how do you feel about that? It's a real problem. You can legislate all you want, but you need both houses to pass a bill. Well, what's a real problem? And this is emblematic of that problem, but that problem has existed in other combinations over the last uh, 15, 20 years. The real problem uh, is that um, uh, one political party views uh, uh, participating in passage of uh, bills uh, that the other party is gonna claim as a win, as a loss for them. And so we're in a win-lose situation. Uh, so in the case of um, you know, Mr. McConnell and assume, assume for now a Republican Senate majority, uh, even if uh, Democrats came up with a bill that was, was uh, supported by a fair number of uh, Republicans and passed it through, um, I think that, uh, and I think this is tragic. I'm just trying to answer your original heed, which is, you know, what do I see? Um, so I'm reporting what I see, but I'm, I'm one of those folks that, that for this, for this point is, is reporting what I see without, um, without, an, without stating an opinion on it. I think my opinion <laughs> is pretty obvious, uh, but uh, from, from, from their perspective, if they let that bill through the Senate, um, is that considered a loss? And is that going to be exploited? That loss, that weakness, if I can put it that way, is that going to be exploited by opponents of those Republican senators come two years from now or by Democrats nationally? Uh, and so you get yourself into this mindset that if you let anything through, other than must pass bills where it's very, very obvious that you have a piece of that or, you, or it's a consensus that um, you know, the American people uh, so, uh, uh, support, um, other than those kinds of bills, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult to get uh, through Congress in a Senate majority under uh, uh, Majority Leader McConnell. Uh, some of the uh, signature bills that I very much believe in, whether they be um, H.R. 1, the Ford of People Act, which is you know major government reform across campaign spending, lobbying, um, et cetera, elections. Uh, to irresponsible gun violence bills that I already spoke to, uh, to environmental uh, initiatives, uh, um, uh, responsible climate change, and on and on and on. Um, those solid bills, uh, I think it would be very difficult in that situation. That's really them. tragic. It's tragic. It's very, we need, well, we need I think it is tragic. Yeah. And there's my, there's my uh, editorializing on, what, on my view now. Uh, it is tragic yeah. uh, because, um, you know, I think these are initiatives that are supported by a majority of the American people, a significant majority, including many Republicans, but back to the basic problem. Um, and that is that uh, many of these uh, Republican senators, they're not worried about their general elections. Um, they're worried about their primary elections. And of course, we have, uh, you know, President Trump, who, who, who wants to maintain, uh, you know, power and influence after he leaves office. And, and so uh, I think many of them are looking over their shoulder at you know, if I'm not, um, you know, bound to the to the orthodoxy of of uh, Trump Republicanism, uh, somebody's going to come after me in the primary. Um, and by the way, um, just to be very equal about that, the same model and the same, uh, um, you know, uh, um, um, milieu, I suppose I would say, exists over on the Democratic side too. Uh, so you know, nobody is excused from uh, the unfortunate consequences of, of extremism in, in our political system and its failure uh, to produce uh, good, solid, mainstream, common sense solutions that can get through Congress and the American people support. Well, you, you'll agree with me that Trump's administration has certainly exacerbated the division in the country. And, and, and I, have a, I have a personal theory I want to run by you, and that is that when he's out of office, hopefully uh, you know, that'll happen in due course. Um, when he's out of office, the power will drain from him. And he can go on and talk radio. He can, you know, have a, another reality show. But the bottom line is, I suspect a lot of people in those 70 plus million people who voted for him are not going to be as impressed when he doesn't have the power of the office. And therefore, you know, between now and the midterms, the, you know, the picture kaleidoscopically is likely to change because of that phenomenon. What do you think? 
Maybe not as much as you think. Um, it is it is clear that um, there's a lot of power in the presidency and and in being in office. After all, if you're in office, uh, it's usually more influential than than not being in office. Um, but I don't think that your that your premise that uh, the power will drain all the way out of you know uh, uh, former President Trump in that in that instance is is accurate. Uh, you take the 74 million last count or so people that voted for him. They voted for him for a variety of reasons, I think. Um, and obviously, one of the things I want to figure out is exactly why, including, again, back to the folks, uh, the, the one in three voters in, in, in my district that I represent, why did they vote for Trump? I think I understand why people voted for President-elect Biden, uh, but I don't pretend to fully understand yeah. um, why folks in Hawaii generally voted for Trump. But, but back to the point, um, the, the, um, um, I would say, I don't know, somewhere around half plus, they're just completely loyal to President Trump. Yeah. So these are not folks that um, are voted for Trump because they were against Biden. That wasn't their primary reason. These were not folks that you know, voted uh, for Trump because they believed that the Democratic Party philosophy on any number of issues, let's take the economy, you know, let's take COVID-19, uh, let's take foreign policy, China. These, these people would, would um, probably vote for another Republican at some point on a philosophical ground, so they're not loyal to Trump. But a great number are completely loyal, uh, and they're going to remain loyal. And Trump is telling them still that um, this election is invalid, and they believe yeah. it. And I think what, that's a real tragedy. What do you think about the possibility of a shutdown? You know, we've, we've seen references to that. Uh, there's a certain concern in the community that a shutdown, especially in, in the context of all the problems, you know, economically and COVID that we have now and all the chaos that's been going on, a shutdown would just make more chaos. Is it coming? Is that going to happen? Well, it's possible. I don't think it's probable. It's certainly possible because we did not pass our uh, appropriations bills for the current fiscal year. So we're talking about FY21, which started on October 1st. And we have to pass those bills once a year, uh, 12 appropriations bills. Uh, I'm on the appropriations committee. We got our job done. We actually came back the appropriations committee in the middle of COVID-19 and spent uh, two, three weeks, I think it was, <coughs> you know, just as a committee in Washington, just getting our job done. And um, it's been, you know, stuck in the Senate uh, ever since. And so because we did not, passed those bills by October 1st, we passed what's called a continuing resolution, uh, which is a fancy way of saying, um, hey, we haven't gotten our job done yet, so just keep spending what you did last year while we, while we do our job. That CR, as we <coughs> excuse me, refer to it, um, expires on December 11th. Now, after December 11th, if that CR um, is not um, uh, extended or if the appropriations bills are not passed, um, the federal government runs out of money. Uh, and that's what the shutdown is. Now, it doesn't happen immediately, uh, but it, it happens soon enough. And that happened just two years ago. We had the longest shutdown in, in our history, incredible devastation and damage uh, <clears throat> to many parts of our, of our uh, country and society, real, real hardship to many people um, yeah. that are particularly dependent. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of pressure right now to either pass those approach bills by, by the 11th or pass another CR. President Trump has said he may vote against, uh, he may veto any of those bills or CR because uh, there are uh, provisions that he considers uh, sacrosanct, like border walls. And he apparently um, is willing um, to, you know, shut down the federal government uh, to get his way in the, in the waning days of his presidency, which I think is its own tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. Maybe he's just bluffing uh, to negotiate something, or I, I, I hope he doesn't, uh, you know, I hope he doesn't bluff and take it to the edge uh, with the American people in the middle of uh, all of this chaos and uncertainty that I already referenced. Yeah. Well, you know, I was happy to see that uh, Emily Murphy <coughs> relented or Trump expected her to relent. And uh, she, she opened, you know, she opened the transition or said she would yesterday. Um, and now, uh, you know, Joe Biden has got all, all these people he's appointing. Um, you know, to, to high positions in government. Um, and so you have a feeling of, may I say, normality, <laughs> finally, in this process. Um, that's encouraging. 
Um, but I, I wanted to ask you, as I'm thinking about you know, what we would discuss today, I wanted to ask you if you knew any of the people he's appointed or if you had, you know, had some kind of proximity to them where you could speak about the quality of these appointments, the quality of his transition, and the likely quality of his administration on January 20th. Well, um, I, I, I know a fair number of them for having met them. Um, I can't say that I know them well. I have an assessment of them both individually and collectively. Cedric Richmond um, who is, um, is going to be part of uh, uh, President-elect Biden's uh, uh, legislative team, in other words, a relationship with Congress, and Shawanda Goff, who is the, the head staff member for the majority leader, and she basically runs uh, uh, the, uh, the floor. Um, they're both going into the administration. I know them both. Um, they're they're high-quality people. Uh, Cedric is a representative from uh, Louisiana, and so, um, you know, he is my colleague. Um, and um, I think that uh, it is, um, from, what, uh, from what President-elect Biden has done so far, it is a good, solid um, uh, group of people, both individually and collectively. Of course, uh, President-elect Biden has focused on foreign policy first. I mean, there is, there is not a lack of quality at all in any of his appointments, uh, you know, at you know, state or, uh, uh, you know, intelligence or uh, national security advisor. Um, uh, good, good folks that have 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 been in foreign policy for for a long time, um, and I think I think really what he is striving for, and I think this is the right choice under the circumstances is is some stability, uh, some some calmness, some predictability, some stability, some some uh, forward uh, thinking uh, direction uh, in his administration that that. Um, still is devoted to the world as it is today, as opposed to you know, when he joined the Senate uh, decades ago, um, but nonetheless um, is, a, is, a, is a, I don't wanna say continuation because that implies uh, you know, uh, rigidity and, and status quo. And I don't think that's where he's going, uh, but the, the folks um, uh, that he has put, on, put in so far in, in the foreign policy side, and I expect uh, that we'll see also on on the, um, um, the, 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 the non-foreign, the domestic policy side are solid people with experience that would, 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 you know, would not um, you know, embarrass themselves in a press conference in you know, Tokyo or, or you know, anywhere else. And I think on top of that, let's, let's uh, recognize that um, he has stated uh, that he is very much interested in a very diverse administration, uh, whether it be ethnic diversity or geographic diversity or gender diversity, and he's honoring that so far. I mean, this is at the end of the day, this is going to be certainly the highest number of you know women ever in an administration, rightly, um, and uh, starting, of course, with with uh, with the vice president. Uh, and so I think he's on the right track here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the rest of his uh, nominations. Now, I still what have to the... go ahead. I still have to oversee them. So. Um, you know, just because I went from a Republican uh, president uh, and his administration to a Democratic president and his administration doesn't mean my responsibilities uh, as a separate, independent, co-equal branch of government don't, you know, somehow change. And so um, the responsibilities are the same. Um, you know, I'm just hoping that I don't have to disagree so deeply uh, with with uh, so many of the actions of an administration in areas like the environment. Uh, or in some cases, foreign policy. Well, you, you've talked about, um, of course, policy. You've talked about their qualifications. You know, you've talked about their diversity. But you know, it leaves me wondering what's going to happen in the Senate when they come up for confirmation. Um, and, and it refers back to what we were talking about before with Mitch McConnell and you know this this argument between this ongoing argument between the Senate and and the Democrats. Um, and I wonder uh, if you know how they stand politically. Uh, whether any of them are going to be targets for, you know, trouble in the Senate on confirmation. Well, I think President like Biden, Biden from what, I, what I've what i seen from, from somewhat of the outside here is trying to navigate that very carefully. So he has not, you know, put up any really just off the, off the charts, um, you know, uh, out of the mainstream or for that matter, controversial uh, folks for nomination so far. He has chosen... He has chosen uh, people that he thinks uh, will 
uh, gain confirmation where necessary uh, in in this in the Senate. I think he's he's doing that very very deliberately, um, and I think that that's um, you know um, fair because I think one of the results of this election, if you think about it, was um, <clears throat> that the people wanted to change the president, but they didn't necessarily want to go in a completely different policy direction in this country. Uh, they still wanted a fairly moderate mainstream policy. They didn't want to be out at the extremes of either party. Um, and, and I think that at the end of the day, you're going to see uh, an administration out of the president-elect that's going to have um, uh, roughly that uh, look, although there are going to be uh, areas that, that um, the Republicans uh, in the Senate are uh, probably going to disagree completely with. For example, the president-elect Biden has already said He's going to take uh, the country back into the Paris Climate Accords, as I believe we should do. Uh, he has already indicated that uh, he may try to, you know, stitch together the the Iran nuclear deal again. Uh, those are areas that um, you know Republicans may well uh, uh, balk at. So I don't think he's going to be shy to take on controversial issues. But in his choice of cabinet appointments that require um, advice and consent in the Senate, I think he's being pretty conscious and careful uh, not to you know, um, uh, put up somebody that's just a no-brainer defeat from the get-go, just to make the point. Yeah. You know, a lot of commentators, uh, at least on the, um, you know, Democrat side, have, have said that the, the things the Trump administration has done have been, you know, have des destroyed, um, you know, parts of government. Um, and it'll take Joe Biden at least four years or more to repair those problems and to take us back to normalcy, I, 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 hate, I hate to use that term, as you know, um, but take us back to a place where we can make affirmative, affirmative uh, and constructive steps going forward. So he'll have to look back before he can actually do initiatives going forward in, on many issues. And I wonder how you feel about that. You know, you may have surprises and frustrations in the House going forward um, uh, that you maybe didn't fully expect. You know, we live in a time of uh, chaos and thus surprises. How do you feel about going into this session? How are you girding your loins to deal with those surprises? You know, I've, I've just been in so many situations uh, throughout my life <clears throat> where, um, whether it be in my professional life or my personal life or my political life, that I've that I've dealt with uncert uncertainty. I I, I have you know, uh, um, tried to, to anticipate, plan for, and implement what I, what I can see or what I can reasonably expect. And I just acknowledge to myself at this point in, in, in my career and in my life that uh, uncertainty is just a part of it. And so um, I try to anticipate what might happen and I try to prepare for it, uh, but there are things that come out of the, off the wall. Uh, and you have to deal with that. I'm still the representative, even though I got, you know, thrown a, an outside slider or whatever it might be um, I, that I never expected. Um, but I've, I've just done it so many times that I, I just run myself through a routine. Um, you know, what exactly happened? <clears throat> Why did it happen? What are the alternatives? You know, what can I do to, to, uh, to um, um, you know, effect, uh, um, uh, you know, what my constituents and I believe should be done in this situation? How can I collaborate with others? That hasn't changed. Uh, that doesn't change. Uh, and so I've just, I, I guess, I don't fear uncertainty. Um, I know it's a reality of the world, and I, 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 you know, I try to, I try to control my world as much as I can. Um, <laughs> but um, I can't control the entire world and and my world, and uh, much less the rest of the world. And so, um, what do you, what can you do? I, I think in terms of. Um, I think in terms of damage, if you want to use your word, uh, certainly President Trump has taken uh, actions with his, within his administration that I deeply disagreed with. For example, um, he has systematically tried to take out the inspectors general uh, from the um, uh, departments, uh, the cabinet uh, uh, departments. And these inspectors general are the folks that look over the shoulders of the folks that are actually doing the job. And they're supposed to be independent. Uh, they're supposed to be you know, able to review a situation and report publicly um, as to what actually happened, what went wrong. So they are they are critical uh, to the to the to the operations of government. And President Trump uh, systematically has tried to obliterate them because they have said that what he wanted to do was wrong, or what he did was wrong. Uh, now that's a huge mistake. That's a matter of 
going back and uh, reinstating them and, and putting them back into positions, which President-elect Biden presumably you know, will do. But other things are, are a little bit more long lasting uh, uh, from a damage perspective. Um, one example, uh, and these are areas where President Trump can take actions that, that are binding, so to speak, on the next president um, and very, very hard to unwind. Uh, for example, uh, uh, President Trump uh, decided after decades of, of Republican and Democratic presidents and Congresses to the contrary to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to, to oil drilling. Now that's hard to unwind. Um, so you can't just kind of, you know, hit reverse back six months. He already did it. Yeah. Well, in, you know, in, in you, I, I hear, I hear the, uh, the sum total, the cumulative total of all your life experiences, a lawyer, I hear a lawyer, I hear a guy who's been in, in business and in the tourism industry. I, I hear a guy who has had courageous experiences in the Hawaii uh, legislature and, uh, a guy who is turning out to be a, a venerable, uh, long-term representative of the state of Hawaii, and and a realist who appreciates the options and the the need to analyze them. I admire you for that. Ed. Thank you very much for appearing on our show. I hope we can talk again soon. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to working with everybody down the road at case.house.gov. Case.house.gov. Thanks so much. Stay safe. Aloha.